Phone graduate program directors, and I want to welcome you to SIOC. Um, I think we are going to be in a treat for a treat tonight with um, Kevin Daly and Chris Gannick. The pencil has yet to be invented. That is sharp enough for Kevin when I first got to know him. As Craig and I were building our space in um, Santa Monica, and funnily enough, that was opposite of Saya first, um, first space. But then I think that's another story. I have met Kevin earlier when I was visiting Rice University in 1984. But it was not until when Kevin moved to Los Angeles and initiated his Southern California experience in our studio that Craig and I truly discovered his artistry. Kevin amazed us by turning to a razor's edge shop and look at dimension number. I never forget his ego eye and the force of his will to make things perfect. I didn't know it then, but at the same time I was teaching with Chris in Capoli Pomona. But he was much smarter than I because he left right after and came here because this is much more fun. But now I realize after working with Chris for four years how perfectly matched Kevin and Chris are with each other. Because Chris is equally infallible in his precision when it comes to work ethics, when it comes to the work that you see uh, in the exhibit tonight. And Actually, I really hate him because he makes my job even more difficult. It's impossible to work with him because he's too perfect. Both Kevin and Chris came from Rice. It's one of those places where architecture was celebrated as a craft and a calling. And re cemented their relationship here in Southern California almost 17 years ago. There is a remarkable consistency in the work they've done together. Sharp, intellectually acute, impeccably crafted, sober, sure-footed, but somehow exhilarating. And I cannot help feeling that if the practice was centered in Europe, and in particular in Switzerland, Kevin and Chris had somehow avoided becoming the watchmaker that is in their gene, and that they would be building elegant bridges, train stations, things that we cannot do in this country. The care and precision that they bring to their work is nearly incomprehensible in Southern California, where stucco and studs rules Add to that the social purpose of bringing that studied yet pragmatic view of construction to humble charter schools in off the map quarters of Los Angeles, and you have the formula for a quixotic, intensely focused body of work which is simultaneously high and low, original and ordinary, fragile yet indestructible. This is particularly noticeable in the surreal, even subversive juxtaposition of materials in much of the work, pudgy balloons waded through spiky, drought-tolerant plants, centipede lakes protrude from rough-honed planks of exotic woods, and off-the-shelf garage doors parade down an actual, actual courtyard. 
the, original, the originality of the work that lies not in its formal complexity, but rather in the recombinant DNA of its materiality. Seen through the lens of a practice which is notable for a steady, consistent approach to problem solving, it reveals a subtle yet com compelling ability to discover new application and plumb the depth of a niche few of the contemporary have even noticed. I'm glad to be able to introduce to you two of the representatives of an endangered species, Chris Gannick and Kevin Daly. Well, after that introduction, I'm, uh, I'm thinking two things. One is that Ming might continue discussing our work. And I am so relieved that I didn't get the epithet of the sharp pencil. Um, I think I'm glad that uh, I'm simply part of the team. And uh, thank you very much, Ming, for the comments. We're, of course, delighted to be here this evening. And um, in a way, our conversation is an extension of an ongoing one that summarizes our ideas of a daily practice we demand that our work operate within a broad spectrum of relationships, and that in turn, it is informed by relational potentials. That is to say, that the interface between different and articulated ways of operating in the world are not only able to inform one another, but to thrive into the generation of work. For us, architecture is fundamentally an operation of fusion. In our own practice, those potentials are intertwined and played out with our collaboration with the growing team back at Daily Organic Architects in Santa Monica, with our clients, with the students and colleagues across a range of institutions, both in Los Angeles and throughout the country, and in particular with all of our friends and colleagues here at SciArc. In our own practice, a characteristic of this potential is it's necessarily formed, it is, it is necessarily formed by negotiations, and more precisely, that it exists as leveraging of values and ideas that, depending on the effort, assume different intensities. These are included in the diagram that we see projected on the screen right now. For example, we like to talk about our practice as things that are found and therefore ready-made, and that it address ideas about increasing in adaptation and things that exist on the right as thought and that are rendered through specialized and informed operations of making. One of the guiding propositions of the diagram is that it introduces the idea of production, in essence, the making of architecture, which to us is often tensioned by opposing ideas, both within culture and within technology. And we've chosen a couple here. And, and in the examples of the Concorde, yet to fulfill its full, space, full flight potential, and of the space shuttle in the orbiter first landing at, uh, in Florida. Both speak to the, the aspirations of a culture which values its achievements as they are rendered through the problem of airframe construction to facilitate, in one case, hypersonic travel, in the case of the Concorde, and space travel, in the case of the orbiter portion of the space shuttle. If we understand these as paradigms, it is precisely because they speak so eloquently to a set of possibilities, and as well as imminent failures. And we view these examples as kinds of porous and fluid frameworks for understanding opportunity within the larger world, and kinds of meta or overarching problems that architecture can be informed by and engage directly. So our work then tends to operate within the premise that architecture is capable of producing not only resistance to pervasive ideas, but to question them as well. For example, as we go back to the diagram, some 15 years ago, Kevin and I um, adopted a couple of what we like to term office pets, the guppy at the upper left and the mosquito on the lower right. 
The guppy, or pregnant guppy as it came to be known, first took flight in 1962. Its purpose was to facilitate the transport of the booster stages of the Saturn IV rocket that would eventually launch the lunar landing efforts in this country. The idea was to deliver the rocket stages prefabricated first in California and flown across the country to Florida where they would be then assembled. In its transformation of the then ubiquitous Boeing Stratocruiser B-377 through what is generally referred to within aircraft manufacturing as an operation of massive enlargement in a term that Sarah up in the office seems to enjoy, the guppy exemplifies for us the potential of what we have come to refer to in our work as a project of extreme modification. And this operation has come to characterize and continue to operate throughout a range of residential and institutional projects that are primarily located at the upper left hand upper left hand corner of this diagram. Our, our other and unofficial office mascot is the mosquito. This little speed devil came out of the concept that sought to incre increase flight precision by enabling aircraft to travel faster, be lighter, and to fly higher, all the while able to absorb and resist the higher pressures of such travel and the inevitable stresses that the aircraft would be subject to. The Mosquito, produced by de Havilland, first flew in 1943 as a mission pathfinder. The fundamental paradigm reconsideration that enabled its development was based on inverting the then prevailing assumption that metal stress skin was strongest and most efficient with the notion of a lightweight composite construction consisting of molded sandwich panel that included an ultralight balsa wood core sandwiched in between inner and outer plywood skins. We have come to include this kind of inversion as generative to our approach, and in certain projects, we have come to describe it as an operation of radical optimization. Within this system of tensions, we understand that the idea of shop and of shop culture as enabling the negotiation of built variables. In the middle is an image of the, of the sculptor David Smith's shop in Voltri, just outside of the outskirts of Genoa in Italy, photographed in 1963. You probably all need little reminding that Smith is most recognized for the way his work questions the capacity of primary geometries, that is to say, squares, cubes, cylinders, triangles, etc., to transcend the geometric structures and to behave in highly emotive and expressionistic ways. In a way, for us, the shop is both an intellectual and a physical mindset for engaging relational capacity, for scrutinizing opportunity and potential, and for assessing the consequent force that comes out of encountering firsthand man-made objects within the physical world. I should have changed that earlier. I think what's indicative to us is not only the fact that the shop is in a way not only a place for thinking, but it's not exactly a place of retreat. It's instead we understand it as a place of assimilation where competing ideas get an opportunity to play themselves out and in which the best of them find opportunity to become uh, the ones that are worked with. This is a, a, a view and comparison of our own shop. It's a tiny little corner where an intern model builder generally gets to spend much of the summer. And there's a full array of equipment that kind of conditions that work surface. There's printouts and cutouts from our laser printer. There's sticks of basswood. There's a components of a speed rail system, models, leftover pieces, all of which go into the way we tend to recycle and both uh, invent ways of working. I really like the illustration of this idea um, and these the previous thoughts in the way that it's rendered in a 1943 photograph of a Mohali Naj project. Um, it's a project that involved the design of bed springs and they were produced for Chicago's sewing and company bed spring manufacturing. As, de as the director of the then Chicago Design Institute during the war, Mahali Naj had been asked by the city's mayor to take charge of what was then the 
a strategic camouflage operations for the city. Um, what this entailed specifically for Maholinaj was getting to work on reconsideration of commonplace materials from which could be extracted unexpected and apparently contradictory behaviors. He clearly allied the, shop, the school's shop with what was intended to be the retraining and education of returning GIs from the war. This not only was a smart move to secure ongoing funding for the school through the city's coffers, but enabled him to develop a series of courses based on fabrication and shop work, and saw that these became both highly therapeutic in value, but also fundamentally about the reopening of an imagination that had perhaps been inhibited, and, uh, open and, and once again engaged uh, a traumatized uh, mindset. This is a very quick example in which a rigid board is milled, joined, and cut into smaller independent, interdependent laminations to form a kind of resilient mat. In essence, a very cushy wood, wooden spring system, which relied on for their making it was, during the war at least, a readily available non-strategic resource. To test the bed, Mahali Naj simply had the school janitor uh, pose for the photograph to prove how um, comfortable the structure was. As we look to where our practice started and the kinds of buildings we have come to work on, a couple of circumstances resonate with us. One, that what is often and increasingly understood as a model of future megalopolises, so this is the Los Angeles Basin on the left, obviously, is really framed by an expansive network of fabrication and manufacturing operations, from past and current aircraft industries to contemporary technologies, and a series of essentially independent but interconnected fabrication shops, none the least of which are those that service the building industry itself, all of which are wrapped within the vast shipping and distribution networks that come with it. And two, that the city's fabric, as we've come to know it, is largely made up of modest, almost indistinct, and often purely functional shells, mute in nature, but nevertheless delicate and complex, even as they are pervasive. Which gets us to the project album, a kind of family portfolio that argues for a couple of central realizations for us. One is that, as Kevin likes to often say, we have only really worked on what are crappy buildings, but nonetheless ones which have enabled us to play out and test without preciousness, but with precision, the interconnection between approaches, approaches of extreme modification and radical optimization. And so here are the transformation of those views through an array of projects that go from institution at the upper left to residential in the middle, to a series of ongoing projects at their lower right. So in this next part of our conversation, Kevin will walk us through a series of institutional and residential projects that exemplify how we continue to work and to tackle some of these ideas. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, <clears throat> show some images of some of the things we completed and, and that are just in the, in the process of working on now. Um, obviously this uh, owes a huge debt to the people in the office um, as we get into you know, the, the more complex projects, um, many of whom uh, probably would have liked to join us tonight, but the first shift doesn't end for another hour and a half or so. Um, but I think, you know, as Chris was saying, um, you know, Los Angeles uh, is filled, um, I'll say something that's going to surprise you, but I'll say it anyway, uh, it, with junky buildings. And, and, you know, I think as we started our work, those, are, those were really the only ones available for us to work on. And I, we started uh, our practice during a recession. No one ever, I don't think people believe that could ever happen again. Um, but there was very little work um, when we started. And um, I think we kind of learned to build and learned especially the kind of regulations related to building, in part by this kind of very empirical um, process of taking things apart. <clears throat> and I think a, a big part of that is, uh, is kind of learning to appreciate the sort of genius that makes these things so pervasive and, and the sort of logic that is underlying them. 
and that becomes a part of the strategy for how to take things apart. And I think Chris um, talked about this guppy. Uh, I, you know, I, we, we've talked a lot in the office about the sort of relationship of sort of aircraft and manufacturing and, the, and whether or not that has a strong relationship to the process of architecture. <clears throat> I, I wondered um, whether or not the sort of you know, the, the stronger uh, relationship was the fact that our first office was at the Santa Monica Airport. But um, in fact, uh, you know, I think I have to confess that I went to the place outside of London where um, it was like the Mosquito kind of like Hall of Fame, um, which was incredibly uh, disappointing. It was run by guys like the people who run the trains out at Griffith Park. You know, they were kind of like repairing these things with Luan plywood and putty and. Um, so, and I think, but I, but I think the thing that's really characteristic of these things is that those things, ha the the manufacturing and the artifacts they produce, really were a momentary phenomenon. And I think you know the and and there is uh, you know I think along with that kind of the sort of beauty of that kind of technology, things like the guppy also kind of bring forth this idea of, of this kind of impossibly ugly beauty. And there's kind of an ungainliness, and, and there's a kind of ungainliness in, in performance. And I think those things also really contribute to the way that we think about things. So here are a range of, uh, of projects that are kind of extreme modifications. The first was a, a residential project. This one was kind of our first public project. We sort of stripped the sides off the, of a building at Pico and Main in Santa Monica and kind of tried to turn the building into a little bit of a, a, a nightlight. And that sort of had this other, kind of introduces other urban agenda of, of kind of trying to ignore the boundaries of the site and let our project kind of spill onto the site. And those things really influenced the way we worked on the projects that are more in the center of the city around MacArthur Park. Little bungalows. And so that's what I'm saying. Each of these buildings, the, the things that make them builders' buildings and make them ubiquitous also have some kind of underlying logic to them. And I think you, you really need to kind of embrace that logic and, and not you know, and acknowledge that in fact you can't change the DNA of them, but you can really still substantially change the, the thing that's built around the DNA. Um, this was a small uh, addition to a Greg Ain house, a uh, very uh, poorly, um, uh, unsympathetically renovated Greg Ain house in that beautiful tract uh, in Palms. And we added just this, you know, very kind of distinctive and carefully made box behind it that had a kind of sun control system and the people had a really beautiful library and, and what we tried to do is just make sure that um, the structure itself became, let's see here, the structure of the building also became the thing that supported the sort of program of the project and, and kind of built all the kind of book storage and um, textile storage directly into the building. Uh, about four or five years ago, we started working for a, a, a small uh, economic development company started by an Episcopal priest, Philip Lance. Uh, I think we've been really fortunate to be able to work with him. Um, he's a, a really remarkable uh, character who uh, I think one of these people who sort of reflectively asks why not, and I think that became a part of the way we started thinking about the work we did for him as well. Uh, we've done. I guess four or five projects for him so far. Uh, I think as he's maybe not so active as uh, as a priest anymore. I've never really talked to him about that, um, which is counterintuitive, I, I, you know, because I think really working with us requires a, at times a lot of prayer. Um, but the first building he bought was a, a mini mall. This is a, 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 f a famous photo by. Um, Catherine Opie of, of the, you know, from her mini mall series uh, and this was the the building he purchased um, and at the time he was going to he bought it to make these offices for this uh, janitorial kind of worker owned janitorial company he had and decided it would be better to focus on the next generation the janitor's kids and open a school which he knew kind of nothing about and and so to round out the team we also didn't really know anything about it and um, so we said, yeah, you could do it. But let's take a closer look. The Catherine Opie, we realized that our mini mall was like a clock short of being a full, you know, a full mini mall. Um, 
and the strategy really was a matter of um, of kind of pulling the building apart and at the same time leaving it as much intact as possible and that became the sort of you know kind of guiding strategy for all these renovation projects is really the kind of transformation has to happen in ways that are kind of significant and profound but also kind of embrace this sort of um, kind of a cult program of things that are going to be necessary in the transformation of, of, of um, kind of commercial buildings into, into institutional ones. Uh, so you can see the kind of wood framing, uh, the sort of tra the uh, modification of the lowest levels of the building. Let me see if I can do this. Um, I'll stop flipping this around so we'll know which end is the pointer. The w existing wood framing, we had to kind of equalize floor levels, added pieces to kind of seal it from the um, street. But really, the sort of principal part of the project was adding this freestanding building within the project. And that kind of had to have this complicated program of doing everything that was needed to let the building become a school. And it was this kind of fifth facade that was added within it. Uh, that had to address all the exiting issues and, and things like that, but also had to become the thing that kept um, uh, soccer balls out of the windows and things like that. So, and in some cases, the building was only a couple feet wide, and that was really all we added, and everything else was just the existing building that stayed intact. Uh, and, you know, and then in addition to that, kind of negotiated with the building department to kind of change the exiting system and things like that. Recovered sort of additional spaces to make outdoor classrooms and reading rooms. And then the whole sort of public area had to kind of have these multiple programs to support, you know, the Thanksgiving pageant and that sort of thing. Um, but I think we're the reason. One of the reasons I say we were fortunate to work for these guys is that I think we were, we kind of got lucky in the fact that they really didn't have the resources to kind of buy up the block and fence it off and turn the whole thing into a school. So there was this kind of incremental process where instead of making kind of an enclave, we actually had to slowly make it a, a educational precinct. So they kind of. Um, each step of it had a way of supporting the kind of informal program of kids getting dropped off and picked up and, and then they slowly started working their way up the street. Um, so there was the first building, uh, then um, a building that uh, Alice Kim sort of generously referred to as a dingbat office building. Um, and virtually every structural engineer in town has worked in this building. So this was John Martin's uh, original office before they moved downtown. Um, and we, uh, one of the guys in the office managed to convince the building department that the warehouse over here that was built in the 20s and this building that was built in the 50s could actually, you know, were, were in fact one building and managed to kind of integrate them so this kind of central circulation system could, um, could support, you know, the entire uh, building being pulled together as a middle school. And then what we did was, you know, the, is kind of lighten the facade even further and kind of make it so that it was um, just a perforated metal screen, just a scrim, and you see kids walking back, back and forth in silhouette as they go from class to class at each end of the building. Uh, and then this is probably, you know, the kind of biggest um, kind of radical modification project we've taken on. This is a building that was built as a wind tunnel for uh, uh, for a, ser uh, a number of a half dozen uh, aircraft manufacturers in Southern California, um, designed by engineers from Caltech, and this big piece of equipment that you see being installed, um, w it was really part of the neighborhood. They they kind of borrowed all the power from Pasadena's power station, and where uh, this photograph is being taken, I think, on a big gas tower. But um, it was this sort of phenomenal, sort of natural system that was in, in place. And, and apparently after World War II, like in the late 50s, they could uh, get the speed of this thing up to like almost Mach 2. So it would be this kind of howling thing that made that part of the city sort of shake a little bit. And um, I, I, for us, you know, one of the biggest parts of the strategy was, was finding ways of bringing, you know, we had this sort of giant windowless concrete box, finding ways of perforating it and bringing natural light in. And so a lot of the early studies were really just a matter of kind of skylight studies and finding ways to, to glaze and open the building. And, uh, 
and, and really uh, an awful lot of the work, it was a huge building, um, was really just a matter of kind of stripping it down and finding the sort of, you know, sort of you know, basic, you know, inherent uh, integrity to it. Um, and also kind of pulling pieces apart. Um, and it was big enough where if you, we focused the work, we could, you know, take away pieces that where we all also, also needed to, uh, you know, modify the structure or solve a handicapped access problem or something like that or bring light all the way through the building. Um, a big part of this project was finding and um, working with a system of uh, a, a skylighting system. We were sort of on this kind of, kind of like super highway of, of um, you know, of despair. Every time we tried to lighten these skylights further, they became more expensive. And, and so we finally made this deal with our one of the structural engineers on the project that if we just put everything back on the roof and it weighed less than the part we took away, he wouldn't object to it. And that became this kind of negotiated strategy throughout the building. We um, took away roof deck and, and that was all weighed as, as part of the kind of overall massing of the building and then used these very light steel frames um, to support a, a fabric skylight system you can see being installed in the lower image here. And the way these guys, um, this company uh, worked with this ETA, ETFE system which has been used a lot in Europe, this was the first um, North American installation. They um, use three layers of this uh, fabric that's sort of, you know, about, uh, it's, it feels like almost like clear, a uh, clear FedEx envelope. I mean, it's, it's kind of, you can't tear it, it's sturdy. Um, they print two layers of it. And one of the things we wanted to do, they had like a lot of checkers and dots and things like that. And we wanted to kind of push the sort of graphic parts of it along. So we had Bruce Mao's office work with us on a kind of light uh, control pattern, interference pattern. They print that on two surfaces, the outermost surface and this middle surface. And by changing the way this kind of pillow structure is inflated, um, those two printed surfaces can be pushed together and block the light or can be pushed apart and allow light in. Um, and uh, that became sort of this overall strategy that, you know, because this, the school was taking over this part of the city, it, we kind of set these big glowing things in this roof garden at the top because we really felt like, you know, kind of making a marker and, and making a, um, a kind of landmark that let light out and indicated what was going on in the school was a really important part of the program. We put all the kind of print shops and things like that at street level and created this pedestrian area. These are some of the classrooms, some of the huge uh, exhibit and event spaces. Um, made this palisade with, um, with uh, shipping containers. On one side of it is uh, the shop for the sculpture fabrication uh, shop. And went the yard for that shop. And then this side is kind of both loading dock and a kind of a reception area for the graduate uh, um, gallery that's just immediately outside of our picture. So all the kind of outdoor spaces had to be kind of multi-programmed with these kind of competing, conflicting programs. Uh, and then I'll, I'll show you a couple images of a project that's sort of just underway now. Um, we're working, uh, this is uh, Harvard's campus here. This is our site over here and that's I guess far enough away um, for them to trust us. We, um, what we're doing is, is building a, a, renovating a building um, so that they can empty out the Fog Museum um, which they tell me has been overdue for a renovation for 50 years. Empty it out and then that gets renovated by um, Renzo Piano and then they will continue to use this as kind of an art conservation uh, uh, facility. So this is the existing building, um, and this is the building they purchased. I, I kind of, you know, we kind of talk about these junk buildings in Los Angeles, but at the same time, this street here is called Western Avenue, and then I saw this building and I kind of felt like, you know, these are my people. Um, so what we've um, started, this is only like a six-year-old building too. Um, we started to, we st we're just in the programming phase now. Um, 
and started to realize that there was you know, there was kind of both more and less program than could fit in the building in, in certain ways. So these are kind of early sort of massing and kind of allocation and zoning studies. And this is what we were calling the Rosetta Stone. It's a re kind of combination of all the program elements in, you know, kind of configured to show whether or not they're high security and high loading and things like that. Um, what we realized was that if we started to really look at the program carefully, the program that needed both high floor loading capacity and high kind of climate control standards was really gigantic. And the part that could really just go directly into an office building was actually pretty small. And so now we're working, we're kind of working with the client to kind of review some of those options. We may in fact, you know, do something other than modify this building because it, it kind of both at the same time does and doesn't fit. Um, I'll show you a couple other renovation projects. You'll recognize these drawings, uh, really important in the history of uh, SciArc um, and this publication. Uh, we um, have renovated Amorphosis building. Uh, you may get a chance to do this uh, at some point. Uh, which, I, you know, I really w wouldn't recommend as kind of a career enhancer. Because I, I think you can see in a lot of the uh, projects we've worked on, um, am I going to wreck this thing isn't one of the questions we usually have to ask ourselves. Um, but but um, we really, in this particular case, we actually started by, you know, kind of uh, adding some furniture to the inside and then it turned, it kind of like, as projects sometimes do, got more and more complicated. Um, we ended up, you know, one, you know, it was more, it sort of turned into more of a sort of thing like, you know, what were they thinking, what would they have done, and, and we called some of the people who had worked on the project, you know, early on, and, you know, now they're like in charge of firms in New York, and, you know, it's like, you can imagine, you know, that no one can remember. It was 20 years ago, they are interns at Morphosis, and, like, there's a guy on line two wondering if they can remember what size the concrete board was supposed to be. Um, but in, in the process of working on it, they also purchased the, the land immediately next door to them and we started looking at a way of kind of transforming that into, a, into you know, without changing the existing building too much, into another uh, piece of a building. And the program for that really was to kind of make a big outdoor space for kind of parties and, and for receptions and things like that and then make a very small guest house uh, adjacent to it and that was going to be prefabricated and built up on this plinth that you can see this big swimming pool next to it um, and uh, and really kind of keep the the uh, the new building as, as kind of separate from this really beautiful kind of elegant box as separate as we as we could um, this building has been kind of put on hold I think right now it turned into a, a, a nice commission for a landscape uh, architect in town uh, and I think for now our part of it is on, is kind of in, on hold indefinitely I'll show you a couple others real quickly um, that are kind of in process. This is a sort of a uh, you know little ranch house in Santa Monica. Um, we're kind of shaping it. It was a little bit larger than you could uh, build by kind of contemporary uh, zoning standards. So we had to kind of carve away at the addition um, and leave the parts of the building. Um, uh, intact where we could. Um, I think when we started working on this we couldn't remember whether you always should or always should not hire a contractor uh, who had gotten a degree at SciArc. Um, and we ended up, we, we did hire one and it, it turned out he's a, he's a great contractor. Um, and one of the things I like best is the kind of steel frame that gets added to support the new construction. One of the things I like best is he made a job shop, or his job shack, out of pieces that he scavenged from the you know, from the renovation, from the demolition phase, but also made it the waterproofing mock-up. Uh, and so here's some of the steel frame that's uh, just in place now. Uh, this is a very small house up in the Hollywood Hills, uh, you know, a, a really small residential project. The people in the office really like doing this kind of work though. I think the scale and the sort of tactility of it is something that I think all of us value kind of throughout the studio. Um, this thing is really about kind of, I don't know, this sort of a Cheshire cat kind of t 
tail, or they call it the gramophone, that the building just kind of spins and becomes a second floor uh, with this, you know, kind of skip, uh, you know, board and bat and siding. And then this is another project that's just underway in Venice, uh, a couple small existing buildings. Um, it's for a family. Um, one part of the family's here, another part's here. And it, so the project, uh, it's sort of like when the kids are riding in the station wagon, they say, no, my arm was there. This is the kind of you know, sibling rivalry zone uh, right in here. And, and the parts we're adding are just pieces that kind of reach into that area. So here are some of the early kind of study models uh, of these kind of uh, telescoping pieces that reach into the uh, landscape area. And then here are some of the sort of skin pieces that are getting kind of wrapped around it and those become outdoor spaces and little studies inside the buildings and kind of bedroom extensions. Uh, so then the, the other, the next round of projects are these kind of optimization projects. These are new pieces. Um, one of the first projects we worked on together was this Topanga Canyon house that really kind of crystallized a lot of the way we approach things. Um, this building was like just one structural bay wide of a, of a manufactured uh, system and really learned a lot about the kind of perverse nature of, 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 um, of that kind of system that in fact almost nothing was, was pre-made in this, in this system, that, it, that in fact it was sort of an operation of, of allowing a range of possibilities um, and that is something that really informed a lot of the ways we think about modifying things as well. Uh, this is a house down in, uh, southern, in uh, North San Diego County. A uh, very simple steel frame held up by this uh, kind of big uh, shear element that's the fireplace. The steel of the roof extends out to hold these big uh, uh, garage doors that kind of extend the interior space to the outside and help shade the interior. And also at the same time kind of protect it from, uh, uh, from fire. Uh, this, was, this house replaced one that burned in a wildfire. Um, we've done a, a series of projects for uh, uh, the city of Santa Monica. We've uh, modified, um, you know, in some ways modified a building system. This one was, I, I think, the people that invented it imagined it could be used for uh, like AM, PM, Marts. Uh, I really like the modesty of this, though. It was, it was nominated for one of these awards. You know, those are they're hard to get, um, but. I really liked the system. Uh, it was a very, it was kind of a conventional, you know, steel frame system and a very high strength concrete that was placed on top and made this composite wall system. Um, and what we had to do was, was find a way of building things that were kind of both identical and different in every condition, you know, both programmatically and kind of geometrically. So they had to kind of move from being um, concession stands to storage areas to restrooms and things like that and fit in these odd areas of the parks. And we were trying to keep the parks, you know, in uh, operation as much as possible and take away as little, you know, land as possible. Um, so it, it kind of turned into a, a, an effort of identifying and um, making sort of the biggest imaginable pieces that could be delivered to the site. Um, here you can see uh, kind of a periodic table of all the buildings that we built and each of their elements. Um, and uh, this is, was also kind of a SIARC project. Jeff McKibben did a lot of the kind of early studies in, um, in uh, you know, for milling this kind of surface that we were trying to create that could be continuous and, and, and uh, sort of add continuity from building to building. You didn't really have the kind of scale elements you would normally have for a building because they were kind of low and we were trying to um, let them sort of be variable within the kind of landscape setting that they were placed in. Um, but you can see here the, the steel frame system, the white that you see underneath there is the form liner that we you know, machined and vacuum formed. Um, these were all made up by this next to the giant prison in Corcoran, California. I think the flaw in this <coughs> was that um, the guys who made the precast were just impeccable, um, and we, uh, we then we put like virtually the entire project in the hands of a contractor who really had a hard time getting to the job site every day, and you know you know maintaining you know just sort of the basics of um, of orientation. So the irony was that we we kind of developed this system with this expectation that it would minimize const the construction period, and I think by the time it was. Uh, 
done. I was the only person in the office who was, who was working there when the project started. It just kind of dragged on for a, a couple of years as the city fired contractors and hired new ones. Um, but you can see here that there were two, two building types, kind of an opaque one uh, that was the concrete system and then a more, trend, you know, a, a more open one, a lattice system that was uh, used for scorekeepers' booths and things like that. Uh, this is a very small studio up in Silver Lake, an uh, artist studio. Um, you can see these guys kind of threading this light control system through it. Um, this is the studio itself. It's all really kind of basic carpentry. Uh, all these things kind of vary depending on what their orientation is. I, I really like the way this woman works. She kind of cuts everything up into little bits and puts them all back together again. Um, part of the way she does that though is by using these walls as projection surfaces so it's really important to have this really high level of natural light but at the same time it could never be direct or it would really interrupt the way she worked so what we did was really develop this as a way of kind of bringing a lot of light in and putting a lot of ventilation in the very upper levels of the building so it could stay cool and be comfortable in the summer there she is struggling in with some more paper to cut up into tiny little bits um, and then this is, uh, I think there were just one or one more project, um, or maybe one or two more. Uh, this is a, a project just immediately south of the Arts Center uh, building that we renovated. This is, a arts, this is their housing, uh, student housing project. Um, this has been through a number of different iterations. Uh, it's a you know, relatively high density uh, housing project. It's originally going to be about 300 beds. Um, as we've kind of developed it, we've pulled the building apart um, in an effort to make sure that we had uh, ventilation all the way through it. And so now are these kind of long strands. Um, Art Center, uh, you know, the students tend to be a little bit older. It's probably a little bit, you know, like SciArc, they've gone to other colleges and, and the kind of traditional student housing just didn't really fit. Um, the way their students live. So what we tried to do is make these kind of big lofts. These pieces here are identical. These restrooms, they'll be factory made. And it's kind of a art center industrial design project. The kitchens are identical. So basically all the plumbing and electrical goes just in these cores that repeat every 20, 25 feet or so. And then the studios are open and so people could choose to have like a substantial amount of social space or, or virtually none. They kind of can program this, you know, as just kind of an open loft and, and with this, you know, huge amount of glass front and back. And then this breeze soleil is kind of a sun control system. Since we had to build the building out of concrete because of the, the um, height restrictions are so strict there, what we realized is we could build the entire building uh, without air conditioning. So by using the mass of the building and kind of controlling the way it's, uh, the sun hits it, it will stay cool enough um, throughout the year to, to not need any kind of compressor cooling. We'll have a geothermal source to, you know, the very hottest part of the year. But it, it, as it turns out, and they, the people in the city of Pasadena said it was the first housing project in 25 years that was being built without uh, uh, compressor air conditioning. So these are some of the early studies for the sun control system, the kind of breeze away. And this is one of the more, this is kind of the direction it's going, these fins and they kind of get rippled and, and directly behind them are each student's uh, small balcony. Oh, that's right, the high school, how could I forget? Um, this is a, one of the, the, you know, it's the most, it's the, the most recent project for Camino Nuevo, the charter school people we started working with on this kind of skinny little site that we always kind of refer to as a, as a RISD site. You know, they always gave these projects on these impossible uh, sites and you, know, kind of, you know, kind of think, well, that's why the buildings are so beautiful, they're so skinny. The site was, you know, it, it really wasn't that much fun to work with. It was, you know, really um, meeting the kind of requirements of the traffic department and things like that were, were extremely difficult. Um, but it's kind of a, administration, uh, kind of a long strand of classrooms and kind of a bushy tail. Um, and uh, it's, a, it, it's about 400 feet long on Silver Lake Boulevard. So what we tried to do is, is kind of change the sort of nature of the cladding so that it kind of uh, emphasized the concavity and convexity of the, of the side. So as you kind of came along 
um, especially at night, you kind of feel the building kind of moving forward and moving away from you. And here's the, the finished uh, uh, surface of it. Part of, you know, part of the sort of premise also was that um, the building's a concrete block building. You can see it kind of coming out of the ground here. Uh, we wanted to um, build it with block because it was so noisy there. Silver Lake is such a noisy street. Um, and the, the metal cladding, the perforated cladding, here's kind of an undercoat, um, also helps keep the con concrete block cool enough so that you, you know, by the time you really start needing air conditioning, you know, the bell rings at 2.30 or 3 o'clock. So there was kind of this energy management system that was part of the kind of overall cladding in addition to the kind of, you know, the visual parts of it. Here's some renderings from the very prow of the building looking back along that kind of curving walkway. This is the view along Silver Lake Boulevard. This is uh, along Temple as you're heading back towards downtown. And what we did was take the landscape and run it kind of directly up onto this mesh so the, the kind of um, mandatory graffiti control area is actually just kind of a landscape surface and the same kind of planting is going to run from that ground on up to about 10 feet onto the face of the building. So I think Chris, uh, I think he's going to uh, summarize a little bit um, in part by talking about the um, the exhibit uh, that's here at the school. I think that really does touch on a lot of the things that have been central to the way we've been thinking about um, some of the other projects that are underway now. So, um, I mean, as I think as our, as our practice progresses and continues to work, um, if ideas like radical and the ideas of optimization and modification and so on continue to thrive, I think one of the important characteristics is of those kinds of operations is that trial and error, for sure, is a really important part of understanding how to make things. And in part, if you wanted to engage in a project that was enabling of trial and error, there probably wouldn't be a better place to do it than at SciArc, where joining now a kind of range of projects that have been gallery installations, I think there's probably been 14 of them. Um, this is one that really tries to take toll or take a, take a larger survey of where we've kind of located our work, not only within the making of it, but within a larger grouping of ideas that it kind of characterize also the way that one might begin to understand the way the world itself is shaped. Um, and these are kind of just riffs on, on different kinds of ideas of tracking information and networks of information and so on. But I remember waking up one morning and hearing our current president speaking about Islamist fascists. And it was a very difficult moment for me because I grew up in North Africa and saw Islam as a culture that was actually incredibly um, enlightened, far from foreboding, and extremely capable of adjusting to all sorts of varying conditions. And the, the map at the top then was one that I went to look at at that morning and really is a tracking of the Silk Road that began in the first century BC and went all the way up to the 14th century AD, which was a profuse network of relationships that really layered itself over a yet forming landscape that was primarily commercial, but then as it gathered influence, became a fundamental way of generating ideas and possibilities within the world, in which architecture occupied a central and unique role for galvanizing relationships between peoples and places and exchanges of ideas. The map below is maybe a more current updated version of that. And I think one has to look at both of these as being simultaneously full of potential, but also fundamentally flawed in the way that they reconstruct the world of relationships. And the, the map below is simply one that vectors um, the places in which portions or parts of assemblies in the prefabrication of the Airbus A380 are located around the globe to then recenter themselves around Toulouse and France. I think that trying to kind of locate oneself in the world really involves an operation that's simultaneously one of disbelief and confirming relationships that are fundamental to the practice of architecture. And 
they have to do with those moments, I think, that really are galvanic in understanding what gives a place, a, 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 a kind of project, a value that's beyond that which may, what may have been intended. This is the Daichonchin Matsuri, um, and it's the Giant Lantern Festival in, uh, in, in Japan, which takes place every August, and which inaugurates this weird and, and wonderful custom of wishing for simultaneously benevolent weather and the expelling of uh, ocean ghosts. One of the wonderful and extraordinary capacities of these giant lanterns is to yield ready-made structures that recreate in a way, in a funny kind of way, the Shinto temple and the relationship and the narrative relationships to it. But it also becomes this kind of deployable structure that simultaneously is in intensely compressed and radically open. Along the Silk Road, there are these incredible moments, one of which happens to be the market at Isfahan. And having been there, remembering some of the places that, that seemed really compelling as opportunities primarily, and ones which bring back and bring together and recollect all sorts of different forms of interaction that are mercantile, that are intellectual, that are ways of imagining the world and without completely forging the way it is to be only in one way and uniquely constructed. This became a kind of... Um, uh, I would say, uh, just a kind of open network. And when we started looking at the gallery space, which turns out to be rather large, 64 feet long and 24 and a half feet wide, we turned to sort of the way that one could start relating the way people circulate and move through it to places that one might gather. And we were really interested in the school not losing sight of its capacity to primarily be a place where relationships between ideas and people needed to be continued to be harvested and needed to, to be supported, while at the same time creating opportunities for radical thinking and completely unexpected relationships. So starting at the upper left, we started by the most obvious and then all the way to the right, maybe the one that we landed up preferring, but these are fundamentally taking on a material that we found to exist already in the world, so it was very convenient. We had it shipped from Chicago, and it's basically a series of uh, recycled, uh, sustainable material that's um, a paper-based material, uh, compressed slabs of expandable hexel core uh, shipping uh, um, buffers. So each one of the each one of these slabs consists of one of one of the complete slabs. It's 10 inches deep, uh, four feet wide, and six feet long. There were 68 of them in the installation of the gallery, and the project then became an exercise in how to take something that was found and continue adjusting it as it was processed through its travels and through its kind of iterations through the shop all the way to the gallery to take on this kind of notion that the shop is a recurrent and ongoing idea about the forming of the world. So we looked at ways that we can start adjusting it in some ways and combined ways of using both the digital and the analog, old and new world technologies and then batch sourcing it in a kind of very simple organizational structure within the shop on the very right. So all of the components were broken down. The pieces that are being routed in the middle are also paper-based uh, two by fours. They're becoming a kind of their own sort of uh, replacement for lumber-based products in the construction industry. And through their cross-section are very stable. Uh, they don't collect or give off any kind of off-gassing. And they're also really able to withstand, you know, things like termite and sort of or humidity um, sort of uh, uh, kind of controls. The, the kind of radical proposal of this material is that it, it simultaneously is a very dumb sort of uh, uh, shipping container material that you can see in its kind of uh, indigenous formation helps to separate goods in transit. And really the intelligence of it is simply to give structural value to air so that it keeps things kind of tight and neatly kind of compressed during their travels. The posts, on the other hand, were part of a, a very pervasive kind of technology that's most often found in the shipping of domestic appliances. 
And in particular, in sort of things like refrigerators and large transistors, um, and most currently now in the construction industry itself. The making of the slabs and the transformation of each of those slabs really was then an exercise in, in understanding fundamentally the capacity of each one at its extremity to be reshaped without compromising any of its inherent characteristics while giving it altogether a completely different uh, uh, deployed uh, reading. And so at the, at the top are the 11 type, types of piers that, we've, that we produced with the slab material and their relative location within the project. So each one of them lines up organizing and creating certain kinds of relationships to create a kind of maze-like, open-ended array of uh, relationships between spaces and gathering places and trajectories through a single space of a gallery and transforming it into multiples, multiple kinds of opportunities, multiple kinds of spaces to inject into that most singular place. And here is the, the idea of the deployment of that material. So it starts very simply at the back of the room. As the days went on and uh, the day of the opening came increasingly closer, this kind of accelerated substantially, but it landed up being a completely sort of like, just like a Japanese parasol, completely open up to uh, completely engulf that single space of the gallery. So just to kind of, uh, kind of summarize those, these are the slabs and the kind of initial milling. We left the edges after the milling process just very ragged after a single sanding. Milled in the places where the compression struts would be threaded and here's our wonderful crew of SIARC uh, workshop attendees really taking on an operation which must not be too dissimilar to the making of the obelisks at Karnak, but with a very, very different kind of material, a much lighter and easier load to bear for sure. And here are some of those uh, piers now being kind of dragged in, uh, and, and, and I like the kind of very animal quality of them as they get dragged into the gallery. They're able to be carried by two people, so they're very light, they weigh just under 100 pounds. And it really takes on a kind of found space of the school and imagines a way to render it a whole different set of understandings to it, and therefore to the ways we teach and the way we talk about architecture and the way we understand its relationships within the networks of relationships outside of the school. Um, the extended slabs open up to this kind of hexel configuration that is eight inches across in both dimensions and very simply starts capturing a series of transformational spaces, each one of them different, having a very different cross-section and a different progression uh, through the installation. Uh, the installation changes both in cross-section and in plan, both vertically and horizontally, so we imagined a way to make as many moves in as tight of a space possible, kind of the one thing you try to advise students against maybe when they're working on their projects, but inevitably we fell prey to the, to the kind of magic of participating in this wonderful opportunity at the school. As a, just a conclusion, I, I think that the guppy in its true form kind of remains the, at least the, both the intellectual and the emotional maybe uh, mascot of the office, in part because it has these really extraordinary qualities that, that I really like, and that they have to do with being simultaneously resilient and hard, with being able to be absorptive and simultaneously reflective. It's able, the fish is able to collect itself in formations and coral reefs to hide from predators, but because of its inherent structure, which is a kind of rubbery outer skin that's simultaneously compressed and inflatable, and a spine which lacks a, a rib cage, it's able to completely transform itself and really shares, I think, a lot more of our projects than um, we've yet kind of explored. And I think it's going to continue to be the, the kind of intellectual sort of presence within the work in years to come. I think the best way to conclude this is to simply thank everybody at SIARC and the impact that you've had on our work over the years and to help maybe in um, answering questions, we might do that maybe uh, with a glass of wine down at the gallery where I think uh, the upstairs crew has uh, 
s serving some wine and some food. And thank you very much for coming this evening. We really appreciate you, you sharing this with us. Thank you.